Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I'm delighted to be your host. Today, I'm especially delighted because we have an esteemed guest and a friend also, Samaya Khalifa, the Executive Director of the Islamic Speakers Bureau. Samaya, welcome to our show. Oh, thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you today. Well, I'm delighted to have you here. And so I'm going to tell our listeners a little bit about you. Everyone, Samaya Khalifa is a seasoned intercultural consultant and executive coach with a strong background in business and human resources. She's the CEO and founder of Khalifa Consulting. Ms. Khalifa works, well, enjoys working with her clients to drive their business and personal success as they work across cultures. Samaya authored the chapter of Islam in the book, Religious Diversity at Work. She has worked with clients on bringing the conversation about religion to the diversity and inclusion conversation. Her work has gained her many recognitions, including an invitation to the White House, yes, I said it, the White House, and being named a citizen diplomat by the U.S. State Department. Samaya's work has been featured in the New York Times and in the book, 50 Green Card Stories. Samaya, once again, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you today. Oh, the honor is all mine. Believe me, I've been wanting to have you on the show for such a while as we were talking about offline. And I'm so delighted that you could join us and really share um, not only a bit about yourself and your journey and your company and your work, but really this space of diversity and inclusion um, that we're all occupying and, and helping us kind of create more conversations that can be had around it. So let's just jump in now. So tell us a bit about your professional background, your training in ISB. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. So my professional background is I uh, grew up in corporate America, if you will, and uh, did human resources for many years, including a lot of work in diversity and inclusion, uh, project management, minority and women leadership forums, and, you know, I believe that everything and anything that we do through our, throughout our lives comes back to help us in whatever we're doing now. So all that knowledge, all that work, all that training that I did in corporate America, I am using right now, both in my uh, consulting as well as in my nonprofit work. So as you mentioned, I lead a nonprofit organization, the Islamic Speakers Bureau of Atlanta. But I also um, have my own consulting company, which is Khalifa Consulting. So in terms of Khalifa Consulting and what we do is we work with leaders and organizations as they work across cultures. Now, you know, we think that it's important for people and companies when they work, say they have business here and they go to China or go to India or go to the Middle East or what have you, to understand the people there for them to be successful and drive results. But what's really happening is the world is right here. Mm-hmm. So it's no longer where diversity is, is just, you know, male, female, black and white, et cetera. It's, it's much more complicated than that. And as we all know, and the studies have shown over and over and over again, that when we have diverse teams and we leverage that diversity to the benefit of our organization, we will outperform our competitors. And so it is a true, um, a competitive advantage to have the diversity, but if we use it correctly, it would be advantage. But if we don't, then we have a mess in our hands. I love what you said about the world being right here. I yeah. think that that's a fantastic thing, especially since um, we're both based in Atlanta. And as I said to you offline, 
when I first met you, I didn't even know about the existence of the Islamic Speakers Bureau. And when I attended your annual event um, last year, I was just blown away in just the best way possible. I felt like I was in my element because I love diversity within diversity, right? And I was just looking at the sea of just different people, different perspectives, different faces, um, and the allies that were there as well. And so mm-hmm. it was just a, an amazing event. And so I knew I wanted you to be on the show and, and talk about that work, but I also talk about the importance of Khalifa Consulting, because I always say if people want to do something successfully, they have to niche down, right? And so I love that you're specifically focusing on having people learn about Arabs and Arab Americans who are living right here with us, our neighbors, our friends, who also happen to be our co-workers, right? So as opposed to, you know, having, you know, learning what to, learning cultural norms about um, people that are abroad, we can learn how to really and truly work with our colleagues in a way that will not only be good for ourselves personally, but for the team, the corporation, Mm -hmm. the company. And I think that aligns us more with the vision and the mission of the company, right? And that's just, that's just a recipe for success. I really, really think it is. So right. let's get to the next question then with regard to cultural competence, diversity, and inclusion. What clear goals has this helped you establish in your work? That's a really good question. You know, looking back at my life, um, I, I was born in Egypt. And mm-hmm. as a young child, my parents put me into a French Catholic school for girls. Mm-hmm. And so from the age of three, I was bicultural in a sense because I was exposed to both the Egyptian culture and the French culture. And uh, just an anecdote, and when my parents decided they're going to move to the United States, I remember I was in tears. And my mom said, why are you crying? Is it because you're going to miss your friends, miss your grandparents, miss your home, miss whatever? And my reply back to her that many years ago was, no, I'm going to lose my French and I'm going to live in, a, in an English speaking culture. So, uh, you know, the, wow. the French culture, you know, sees itself as much more superior than English and the mm-hmm. English world. So that was so much ingrained in me. And now knowing what I know about cultures, et cetera, I'm just fascinated as a child, how I reacted to that. So in terms of diversity and inclusion and how that impacts me every single day is we all live in different worlds. Uh, We all live in different cultures, whether it's uh, our culture at home, uh, our culture at work, our culture in whatever organizations we belong to, soccer clubs, whatever. Uh, We tend as human beings right here, right here in Atlanta, right here everywhere else in the United States, we tend to be able to style switch. That's what we call it, Mm. where we know what are the norms within a certain culture and we know how to act and, and be part of that culture. And sometimes, you know, the, the learning curve is we don't know what we don't know. And then we know what we don't know. And then we work hard at knowing what we know. And then where it comes automatically, where we are unconsciously switching styles without even knowing it. It's like a child uh, who is, say, two or three and has been brought up in a bilingual uh, culture at home. And they know who to speak Spanish to and who to speak English to or French to and English to or whatever languages are spoken. And they just do it without even thinking about it. Nobody has taught them that. So I think that people who live in different cultures and are able to style switch and they've gone through the learning curve, they do it without even thinking about it. But before we we get to that, it's being aware. Awareness is really important. And one of the things whenever I do cultural training um, or coaching is people are are you telling me to become more American if I'm doing cultural training for the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Or are you telling me to become more of an Arab? No, I'm not telling you or we're not telling you to be anything. All we're saying is having that self-awareness. And the big aha moment for the clients um, that I have and many of my colleagues have is it starts out by becoming more self-aware. And what what am I doing that is culturally mandated, right? And then what is the person I'm working with Why are they acting differently? And could that be from their culture or from what? Understanding where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. An example would be uh, direct and indirect communication. The U.S. cultural norm is to be direct. 
Very, yes. <laughs> right? We're not, of course, as direct to say the Germans are, but we are We are on the directness side, right? Mm-hmm. We tell it the way it is, the, uh, how we want it exactly. Uh, when you come to the Arab culture or maybe the Chinese culture or the Indian culture, uh, they have this concept of saving face. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Right? And so when they do deliver a message or when they say something, then it is more in an indirect way. So they want make the person they're communicating with uh, lose face. Mm -hmm. So you have a clash right there where the direct communicating people are saying, what in the world are they doing? They're just beating around the bush. Can they just say it? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then the people who are indirect communicators will look at the direct communicators and they will say, they're so rude. They don't have any finesse. Mm-hmm. And they just be more, more, uh, more political, more, you know, they don't have to be so blunt. This is, mm-hmm. this is so, you know, not nice to, to speak and to communicate that way. So we see a lot of those differences. And if we're not aware, we just think that the person is being ugly or the person is just wasting my time. Uh, in the contrary, they're being respectful mm-hmm. within their own cultural framework. Oh my gosh, Samaya, so many gems from that. Just so many. I first love that you said, we, about what you said about self-awareness and, you know, talking about your childhood and knowing then that you were style switching. And when I speak with, with some Black people and some African-American people um, in the United States, they refer to this as code switching and mm-hmm. it's the exact same thing. Um, as somebody that I feel like you were peeking into my childhood for a moment, uh, because although I was born in the United States, I left when I was two months old. And I didn't come back till I was two and a half. And so by then I was fully fluent in French and Haitian Creole as my parents are Haitian. And I didn't go to school in America um, for kindergarten until I was five. And so my world was surrounded by French, Haitian Creole and Spanish, Um, some from my family, but mostly because my babysitters were Cuban and Colombian. And so I was an American who spoke no English. Mm. And It was really interesting because you're making me recall um, knowing who to speak French to, knowing who to speak Creole to, because in Haitian culture, that that is a a huge linguistic cultural path that needs to be navigated, sometimes very carefully as a showing of respect, right? But even, you know, who to speak Spanish to, who to speak English to, right? First, it was a matter of communication, but how do children know to whom you should speak what? And innately we do because we're innate with that cultural information that's been poured into us, right? And so as adults, I often wonder why some adults struggle with that, whereas others like yourself, like myself, um, we tend to just flow like water in between those cultures, right? But I think maybe because we're so accustomed to style switching, that it's, it's such an ingrained part of our nature that we don't tend to even think about it. It's automatic, like riding a bicycle. Mm-hmm. I know for me, when, when I um, land in Haiti, all of a sudden, the moment I smell the air, right, which, which is such a sweet memory for me, I, I feel like a little click or a snap. And I already know, like I feel different, even though I know that my, my relatives, they refer to me as diaspora, right? It means... Um, people who have left, right? It refers to generations like me born abroad, but there all of a sudden I'm American. But then when I'm in the United States, I'm Haitian American, Mm. right? And and all of the things that that brings along with it. And ironically, when you were mentioning that, that you were born in Egypt, every person that I have come across in my life that I've had the pleasure of knowing that's Arab or North African, they, I always connect with them through French. That's mm-hmm. always been the connector, you know? And of course we ha- we know the historical reasons behind all of that, but I always find that to be very interesting. Like even if we're both born here, uh, we, we connect through that cultural commonality, that linguistic commonality first. And then we, we figure everything else out afterwards, but that's what binds us together and creates a relationship. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, 
government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. Yeah, you know, um, and just in my opinion, because of how global the business has been and how everybody's here, I truly believe that a competency that leaders and successful people need to have is the ability to understand themselves really well, culturally, Mm -hmm. and then understand the other cultures, because that's going to help them pull teams together, help them motivate people who are different than they are, and, you know, give people the sense of belonging, because we talk about diversity and inclusion. But at the end of the day, people who are committed to organizations, people who give 110% or 150% are the people who feel and believe that the organization cares about them and they have a sense that I have skin in the game and I'm going to stick with this organization. So I think we need to look at that from a business perspective and how much value that adds to, to the organizations that we are part of. Absolutely. Everybody definitely feels the need to be seen. And I think, as you stated, when when people don't feel that they have that skin in the game, when they don't feel recognized and, and seen for their authentic selves, or or even, I like to say, if people don't feel that psychological safety that will allow them to show up as their authentic selves at work, then the whole company loses. The team becomes less productive. Right. And that creates yeah. clashes that need not exist. You know, this is a little bit off, but I want to share it. There is a friend of mine who's African-American, and I've been reaching out to my African-American brothers and sisters and just Mm -hmm. saying, how are you? And and I'm going to get really emotional talking about this, but he said to me, and this is a very successful lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. He said, the majority white community does not see us as human. Oh, my gosh. And I was just like, I almost broke down in tears and my whole body was shaking when I read that text from him. Mm -hmm. And so we really, as humanity, we cannot, we cannot, we must not, it's it's not, that's not the way God has created us. He Mm -hmm. created us all equal. And we need to see the beauty and the value of every and each individual that we have in our organizations, that we have in our life. We cannot say this person is short or this person is tall or this person is, is too black or too white or too whatever. I think I mean, with, with the current uh, COVID-19, we need to wake up as humanity. We really do. And we need to feel the sense that we are one humanity and we need to work together as such. We're not going to overcome all the, uh, the pandemics and all the world crises if we are not together and we value each other uh, as fellow human beings. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. I, I sincerely appreciate that personally and professionally. And this was, and I, I commend you on doing something that I wish more leaders would do, which is acknowledgement, right? And I, I'm a lover of political history and political science. And so I think that when we don't look to the past you know, we are doomed to repeat it, you know, to paraphrase the, the famous quote. But I, I was having this conversation with somebody just a couple of hours ago, a dear friend, and I was telling her, you know, I don't understand why we're seen as less than human. As a mm-hmm. Black person living here in the United States, I'm not African-American, but the struggle and the pain is the same thing if you're Black. And so, you know, I, I was like, don't we have enough to deal with? with being immigrants or or children of immigrants, being, for my friend and I in the conversation, being women, right, having to deal with gender inequity. Um, Don't we have enough to deal with as parents, parents of children with special needs, parents of, you know, parents in general, you know, just business owners, um, Chris, just isn't there enough to deal with? And I think a part of the, the huge part of the problem is that there's not an awareness and acknowledgement of what has happened. And I I said to her, I'm thinking about a quote in political science. I said that, you know, slavery demeans the slave 
master as well as a slave. And so I wish that our country that that my parents love so much, that I love so much, I wish that they could see themselves as the world is looking at us, right? Because you cannot live in this duality. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a very shameful period of history. It's a painful one, but also a shameful one because we don't have enough leaders such as yourselves stepping out and saying, this is wrong. This is not acceptable. We cannot have, and and I'm a person, again, a lover of political science um, and and things political, which is ironic because I, I don't make this show political because I want everybody on it, you know, but I think it's important for us to look at our constitution and for people to really understand what that constitution means. It is a living, breathing document, right? It is an organism that grows as we grow and Mm -hmm. it evolves as we evolve. And so we choose to devolve in in this sense by being less than we're supposed to be. We are not realizing the American dream. We are, we are ceasing to be what that promise is. And so for, for people like you and myself who work in diversity, I really have had to question, what is it all for, right? Mm-hmm. There, I won't lie, the past month, the month of May in 2020 has been truly one of the most difficult as a society, I think, for all of us and for myself in particular. This is why I threw myself into my conversations, you know, offline and online with, with you and others. And, and I'm just like, I need to keep doing this work because... If I don't, then how will we keep the conversations going? How will we dig deeper, right? How do you, hear, how do you make those voices heard, right? Because not all voices are heard. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, thank you for the work that you do. It is so important to bring the voices that would go otherwise unheard, to bring them to the table and let people hear them. So we really appreciate you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And again, it's one of those things where I, I know we are better than this because we, and also too, from an intellectual perspective, from a logical perspective, we cannot continue to exist in this duality, right? You cannot say America, land of the free, home of the brave, when you don't treat everybody the way that we we promise to treat everybody. And I think about, you know, what's that famous saying? Um, It it escapes me right now, but to paraphrase, you know, um, when they came for this person, I said nothing. When they came for that person, I said nothing. And then when they came for me, there was no one to speak for me, right? And so I, I think part of the work of diversity and inclusion, a really essential component of what you do is to create bridges, is to create allyship through learning, through understanding. And I often think to myself, especially of late, why is it that Germany and South Africa, two countries with these histories of just racial tension, cultural misunderstanding and turmoil, how is it that they have come to a better place? Not a perfect place, but a better place. And it was because of acknowledgement that led to reconciliation, but that came because they had to learn and acknowledge what happened, but also through self-awareness, right? And, Mm -hmm. and, people having an, an engaged dialogue. So I, I know I took us off on a tangent, but you know, I love tangential conversations. <laughs> so they're, the best. they're the best. They are the best. They are the best. So what prompted you to create discussions on working with Arabs and Arab American populations? Like what role does this play in relationship building? Sure. Well, actually I got into the intercultural world by mistake. Best mistake ever. <laughs> I know. It's just like really uh, amazing. Um, I lost my job. I was working for a Fortune 100 company and it went from being a Fortune 100 company to uh, becoming a private a company uh, just overnight. And my whole department, which was organizational effectiveness, kind of went away. And it gave me an opportunity to think about what did I want to do when I grew up? Which, by the way, I haven't done yet. I'm still growing. <laughs> it's okay. We're not allowed to on this show. <laughs> And so, um, you know, I I was really doing a lot of soul searching and and finding out what is it that I can do to bring my whole self to to my clients and to the work that I do. Um, Because, you know, growing up in this country, I found myself to have many identities and none of, and they didn't all come together all at the same time to all the people. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was okay with who I was and I really wanted to go out there and help people, uh, understand and build bridges of understanding. And the first run at it was when I started the Islamic Speakers Bureau, which was in August of 2001. Mm-hmm. And that was my, my coming out in the world saying, hey, I am an American, I'm Muslim of Egyptian background, 
And here's what the Muslim community is all about. Mm-hmm. So that was while I was having a uh, career in corporate America. But in about 12 years ago, when this whole thing about my job, et cetera, I needed to kind of reinvent myself. Mm-hmm. And just by accident, talking to people, uh, I found out about the intercultural world. And I said, this is exactly where I can add value and bring my whole self together to people, uh, to my clients. And I just absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. And it brings my corporate experience. It brings my nonprofit experience. It brings my uh, connections in Atlanta and everywhere else. So I do also a lot of cultural training for people coming into the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, So what is it like? Uh, You know, I've done trainings for people coming from India, from Europe, from South America, from all over the world, from Africa, and help them understand what is going on around them. You know, just a simple example Mm -hmm. with, um, you know, when people say, hi, how are you? Yes, it's a cultural shock. <laughs> yeah, and it's and people want to say, okay, they're asking me how I'm doing. Let me tell them how I'm doing. And then the training, it's, it's really being nice. It's not more than that. Exactly. So, so do they really not want to know? So why are they saying it, right? And so, so simple things like that. Or it can be, um, I'm in meetings. And if I don't have anything to say, I'm not going to say it. But these people are, are speaking up and, and, and telling them about, you know, all the things they're doing. And to me, that's just normal stuff. I don't know why they're reporting on it. So we have to talk about, you know, um, individualistic culture and how me as an individual or, you know, anybody as an individual needs to tell people what a great job they are uh, doing and who they are and all those things. Because if they don't, nobody else will, right? Mm-hmm. So that becomes a, a big aha moment for people. And what do they want to do with that, right? So, so understanding the background and understanding where other people might be coming from helps them ground themselves into maybe this is not what I'm seeing or this is something different than mm-hmm. my perceptions are. So it's, it's um, bottom line is helping people being successful in different cultures. Um, there is a misperception, in my opinion, that if I am an A player in culture A, then I could pick myself up and go anywhere in the world and I'm just going to be as successful. And the answer is no, you will not be successful. You have to understand the culture Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how it navigates and then being able to navigate through that and then you could be successful. But you can't pick up and transfer and think that you're just going to plug in and the world is going to go on the same way. You know, when I'm hearing you say that, that makes me think about humility right? Mm-hmm. What that actually means, right? So there's a self-awareness component and then there's the humility component that has to go together for us to get that. to that next place, right? Because what I found is when I, I'm talking to friends and colleagues, and this was especially, I would say, you know, easily 10 years ago when you first enter into the corporate world, like 10 or 20 years ago for me, and people would say that to me all the time, right? And, and I shouldn't even say that long ago, um, because recently, as recently as a couple of years ago, someone said this to me, oh, yeah, you know, why don't people speak English when I go away and blah, blah, blah. And the French are so rude. I hear that so much. And I asked them, why do you think the French are rude? Just as an example. And right. they said, oh, because, you know, they get so angry about, you know, when I'm asking them directions. And I said, well, are you asking them directions in English or in French? And so they say, well, in English, of course, everybody should speak English. And that's one of those key components that I never understood is, and maybe it's because I'm someone who's multilingual, you know, multicultural, and I can, you know, slip into one world or the next. But for me, they're never really separate. They're like circles that are intertwined. And so that makes the totality of me. And so I said, well, have you ever thought about, you know, just asking, learning how to say something in French and, and if you try that, you might get a different response. And, and that's, you know, and then that person said, well, they should speak English. I said, who said they didn't, right? Mm-hmm. But you're in their country and you're visiting them. And I think because of our, our preoccupation, quite honestly, with American exceptionalism, when we travel to other places, we forget other countries think they're exceptional as well, right? Yeah. And, and so the French, like even my, my own husband, when we first started dating, he said, well, French people are so snooty. And I said, how can you even say that? And he used to tease me about that because my first language was French. And I said, you know better. And, and of course he does, but 
I always thought it was so interesting. And then he decided to learn some French. And oh, I said, wow. yeah, that, that's why I had to marry him, Samaya. <laughs> so I said, well, you put in a good effort. I'm going to say yes. But oh, that's sweet. He, he decided that's to learn sweet. some French. I didn't say it was good French. He's trying. <laughs> but right, that's all that matters. You know, exactly. uh, what you said about going in and thinking that everybody should speak English, et cetera, there is a term for it. And it's called ethnocentric. Mm. And ethnocentricity is like my culture is the best culture. Um, And I'm going to measure all other cultures based on my culture. And then a lot of times when I have clients who have that mindset, and like you said, that a lot of different countries think that they are the, you know, the center of the the universe. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's not just the Americans, but others as well. When they do that, they have the hardest time moving to a different culture. Yeah. Because they talk about the different cultures as uh, less than, not as civilized, uh, my culture is better. And if whatever whatever they do, if it's aligned with my culture, then it's a good thing. They're civilized, they're great. But if it's not, then they're not as good as. Absolutely. So it, it's really interesting that you bring that up. And I love that you mentioned that it's not only limited to American culture, uh, because I have relatives that, you know, uh, measure the world by the Haitian standard, you know, right. and so when they come here and particularly my older relatives, right? And so when they come here, it's, it's a harder transition for them, right? right. They are seen as inflexible um, or more inflexible when really they've just, they're, they're ingrained to believe that. It's, it's like they're programmed to believe that because of ethnocentrism. Um, mm-hmm. Ethnocentrism, yes, I'm saying it. <laughs> but but I, I really love that you mentioned that because it, it does shape the way our cultural lens is formed. And I think it makes it harder for us to adjust. And and when we are able to, again, get back to that humility component, then we're able to say, okay, well, this person does this differently, but it's just as good as the way that I'm doing it because we got the same result, right? And I think when you work on teams, that's when there's an opportunity for that, that garden to flourish, right? When we Absolutely. have an understanding that different isn't bad. So right. then let me ask you this. What three things would you like our listeners to know about working specifically with Arab and Arab American people? Sure. Yeah. So three things that are important to know is that Arabs tend to be more relationship focused, Mm -hmm. that if somebody gets a job to do, then they want to know all the team members. They want to build trust. They want to know everything to know, and they want to become friends. And then after they have that, then they will start working. Uh, When you look at the U.S. culture, on the other hand, it's task-oriented, right? So let's see what we have to do. I don't need to know your name. I just need to know you're competent. Let's get working and, and, you know, produce results real quick. Mm -hmm. What the Arabs and other cultures as well, you know, I I mean, uh, Chinese, Latin Americans, et cetera, they're more Mm relationship-focused. So just keeping that in mind, that relationship matters. And being able to put the project timeline, et cetera, with a little bit of time up front to build relationships. Mm, uh, and Arabs are not just the only culture with that. There are many, many cultures around the world that are relationship focused. And I'm just generalizing. It does not mean that 100% of the Arabs are relationship focused. Absolutely. The vast majority of them are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Another one is that they care about their families a great deal. Because mm-hmm. their families, the family is the unit that gives them strength. That gives them who they are. And their name structure is even based on their family's name structure. So you would find a person's first name, then their father's first name, then their grandfather's first name uh, from the father's side, etc. So who they are and what family they belong to carries a lot of weight. And knowing that is really important. And family takes precedent over even sometimes work. So knowing that family matters. We've already talked about saving face. Mm-hmm. Uh, another another thing to know is that religion is important to them as well. Yes. And uh, whether they are Christian or Muslim or even people who don't necessarily believe in anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so religion. So if they're working with Arabs and they happen to be Muslim or Christian or what have you, realizing that religion plays a very important role. Even people who are don't believe in anything, they still are culturally religious. Mm-hmm. Just to give you an example, there is a um, a phrase that's used in the Arab world, and it's called inshallah, mm-hmm. which means if God wills. So it doesn't matter if a person is speaking with a Muslim or with a Christian or people who has no faith, you know, tradition. 
then they will still use the cultural world word, inshallah. So they invoke God's name, even though they don't believe in, in there is a God. So it's just really important to understand that. And one thing is to know when uh, Ramadan is. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and when what that requires. Right, whether they're here or mm-hmm. if they have to travel overseas and they need to hopefully after the COVID-19 is over, mm-hmm. but to know when Ramadan is and stay away from uh, Ramadan doing business there and also know the holidays, know the weekends, when the weekend is, because the weekends are not Saturday and Sunday. In most countries, it is Friday and Saturday. So mm-hmm. being aware of the, cal- the calendar, being aware of the religious traditions is really important. So again, relationships, family, and religion. I love it. I love it. And so Maya, I want to ask you for our listeners a very um, important question that we had uh, the pleasure of having you at the um, 2019 um, Global Fluency Summit. And it was such a, a joy to have you be there to help educate our audience as well as myself. And so you brought about a very interesting point that I, I do want to touch upon with our audience now. Can we talk about the hijab and why wear, why not wear, what does it mean? And really what's what's a polite way for people, or not even polite, quite honestly, because I, I don't I don't always want to focus on polite, but what's the culturally appropriate way to ask someone that question? Because I think there is such a People don't know because they don't ask because they're afraid to ask and offend. So what's a way, if I see someone wearing a hijab, what can I say to initiate conversation and gain some understanding? Sure, sure. The beautiful question. Oh, first the hijab is the scarf that women, some women choose to wear to cover their hair. And they do that as a sign of modesty. Um, They believe that that is the way that modesty is presented within uh, communities and within cultures. If we all look at the Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition, et cetera, we see that women do cover their hair as well. Uh, one time I was working with a Jewish gentleman who was uh, Russian. And every time he saw me, he says, you remind me of my grandmother. And I say, oh, really? Well, you know, <laughs> why? And he says, well, she, she used to wear the same scarf like you do. I said, okay, well, that's a compliment for me. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, it's a sign of modesty. It's, it does not mean that a person who wears the, the head cover uh, is more religious than a person who is a Muslim woman and it does not wear it. It's a personal choice. It has to be done with the woman's own conviction and that's the right thing to do. Um, if somebody wants to ask about the, the head cover, it needs to come from a place of really wanting to know, right? Uh, because I can tell you how many Muslims get questions about stuff that has some underlying um, agendas. Yeah, and absolutely. So, um, you know, can ask, you know, where did you get it from? It's beautiful. Well, you know, that color is really nice on you or whatever. It's like seeing a, a, a woman who wears, who's got a beautiful dress or beautiful shoes or a beautiful purse. What do you, what do you say? Mm-hmm. And uh, just to realize, of, of course, that gender relationships is a little bit more formal within Muslim cultures. Mm-hmm. So it's not as, as fluent or as, as uh, fluid as it is uh, within the U.S. culture, for example. So just realizing that. I love it. So we've talked about not only just how to to engage conversation so teams could be more productive and more proactive, but really we've talked about awareness, self-awareness in particular, humility, religion, and now fashion, (laughs) if we're going to think about it in that sense, right? So thank you for sharing that because I, I think... It's something, at least um, in the, the spheres that I've come across, I've seen it, I've seen people wanting to ask. And, you know, it's, I think there are, there are pathways to navigate any conversation. And so the best pathway would be the one that comes from a place of respect and true curiosity. So I, I'm glad you could help our listeners shape that question, right? So they can engage in a meaningful dialogue. So thank you for that. And so I'm going to to ask you then, what effect do you feel political correctness has had on your work? And and I'll preface this by saying that I do not believe that political correctness lends to accurate communication. I think um, just based upon my my work and my belief system, I think that, and and my work as an interpreter specifically, but I think that this country, um, we're so concerned with being polite and, and putting things in a little category that sometimes we miss the forest for the trees. But feel free to disagree with me because I love that too. So what do you think? I think it's somewhere in the middle, right? So if somebody is just really blunt, 
and lays it, the questions or the whatever it is, just very bluntly. And given that the world is not very direct, most of the world is not very direct communicators, uh, that might not fall too well. So, and like you said, being too politically correct, uh, it's almost like being in handcuffs, right? We can't really say anything or do anything. But I think somewhere in the between, in my opinion, would be the appropriate way. Uh, I want to ask my questions. I want to be able to get answers. I want to be able to be educated. But at the same time, I don't want to offend anyone. So in my opinion, just the middle of the road somewhere is, is, a good, is a good place to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so then how has your work within the diversity and inclusion space affected your interactions with other people, both professionally and personally? What does Samaya take home with her in her mind's eye? I have to tell you, I think I have the best job in the whole wide world. So do. I love the work. Oh my that you gosh. Do. I just love it. I just love it. Um, every time I think I've heard it all or seen it all, um, I get challenged with clients who have um, situations or who see the world differently and having conversation with them. It just broadens my horizons and, um, you know, from the different foods of the world, from uh, just the different perspective, from getting an insider's perspective from different parts of the world about what's going on, where they came from or what have you. Uh, to me, that just keeps me going. It's, it keeps me going. And then uh, learning about their family dynamics, um, helping them navigate in their new world. It just, to me, it's, it's, it's really beautiful. And when I work with groups to do training, cultural training or, uh, or group trainings, it, there's a never a dull moment, never a dull moment. Yeah. And so I love it. I love it. Fantastic. Well, I can attest to how you're bringing people together on so many levels. And, and I think more than you will ever really see with your own two eyes, right? Because it's about what you're teaching others to teach others to teach others. And I, I got to see that again at, at the annual dinner. And I was just like, this is so amazing. And it's, it, it, touched me. It connected me to Atlanta in a way that I hadn't been connected to before. So it was, it was a, a shift for me in the best direction because here I was thinking that, you know, just communities were scattered. And then here you see this beautiful tapestry, um, not only insofar as, you know, religious um, conviction or, or who's what religion, but really a tapestry of diversity of thought, right? And I mean, I wish you could have sat at my table. We had the most amazing conversations. And then I was looking at all the other tables thinking they're having these amazing conversations too. So I dare say the work that you do, I, I know that it is having a tidal wave of impacts, not only here and, and not only personally within each of us that gets to benefit from it, but I really do think globally. And I just, I'm so grateful for someone such as yourself in the world that is creating these pathways and these channels for us to continue to grow and evolve through conversation and through education and through training and knowledge and, and really just fostering these relationships that are going to honestly not only be life affirming, but life changing for so many. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So now, Samaya, as we're wrapping up the show, what are two things you'd like to impart upon our listeners? Oh, well, first off is it's a challenge uh, for each and every one of us is to get to know somebody that seems to be different than you and I are and get to really know them. Mm -hmm. I think people will be very pleasantly surprised. The second thing is taking action in terms of our current situation in this country. The race issue that's in this country is something that I am so scared of. Mm. And if we don't address it, that might be the beginning of the fall of this great nation. And I would hate to see that happen. I mean, it's serious stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely. really serious stuff. And as you said, the whole world is watching us. And let me tell you, we don't look pretty. We don't look pretty at all. And so, um, you know, we, and we can do it. We can do it. And racism is a disease of the heart. And we need to look at our hearts and we need to get rid of that racism in all our hearts. Absolutely. So my country, what it needs to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Thank you so much, Samaya, for being on the show today. And I want you to tell our listeners, where can they find you if they want to connect with you, if they want to learn about Khalifa Consulting or the ISB, where can they find you? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Google my name, you will find me. But um, the website for Khalifa Consulting is uh, khalifa.consulting. That's K-H-A-L-I-F-A dot consulting. And for the uh, ISB, it's isbatlanta.org. And phone number is 678-523-5080. 678-523-5080. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samaya, for being on the show. So everyone, you've heard it here. Learn more about Khalifa Consulting. Get in touch with Samaya. Learn more about the Islamic Speakers Bureau. And once again, I am Bertine Krevacore West, and I'm delighted to be your host for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. And as always, remember, have these conversations, whether virtually or in person, about the episodes. Think about what we've discussed today and start a conversation about this with someone you know, or heck, someone you don't even know. (laughs) So make that your plan for today and for every day. And as always, let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.